The battles of Voja and Kulikovo were not just isolated victories, but crucial links in Rus's strategic resistance against the Golden Horde's domination. At Voja in 1378, Dmitry Ivanovich showcased tactical brilliance. Using the Voja River as a natural barrier, he forced the Horde to cross under unfavorable conditions. Disciplined infantry formations, combined with effective use of archers and close combat units, turned this encounter into Rus's first significant triumph over the Mongols in decades. Two years later, at Kulikovo in 1380, Dmitry elevated these tactics to a new level. He organized his forces into a well-coordinated structure, a strong central unit, tightly defended flanks, and a hidden reserve. By luring the horde into attacking the center and then launching a surprise counterattack from the flanks and rear, the Rus army secured a decisive victory. Voja demonstrated that clever strategy could overcome overwhelming odds, while Kulikovo cemented the unity and growing strength of Rus in their fight for freedom. Together, these battles marked a turning point in the long struggle against the Golden Horde, laying the groundwork for the eventual independence of Rus. Now we go straight to the detail of Voza battle in 1378. The composite bow was the Mongol warrior's most iconic weapon. Unlike typical bows, these were masterfully constructed from layers of wood, horn, and sinew, giving them incredible strength and flexibility. Mongol bows had a range of up to 350 yards, far surpassing most contemporary weapons, and their archers could fire with devastating accuracy while galloping at full speed. They even mastered the art of shooting backward during a retreat turning what seemed like a retreat into a deadly trap. Mongol arrows were equally sophisticated. The shafts were made of wood or reed, while the tips were crafted from bone or metal, designed for various purposes. Some arrows pierced armor, others carried signals or emitted whistling sounds to confuse enemies. Each warrior carried an arsenal of around 60 arrows, ensuring they were never short of ammunition. Mongol warriors were equipped for both survival and battle. In addition to their bows, they carried lassos, battle axes, tools for repairing arrows, food supplies, and leather bottles for water or fermented drinks. Their lightweight yurts, one for every ten riders, provided shelter on the move, ensuring that their armies could camp almost anywhere without slowing down. Armor was a critical consideration for the Mongols, but they prioritized mobility over heavy protection. Most warriors wore thick felt or leather armor often reinforced with iron or bone plates. This combination provided sufficient defense while allowing them to move quickly and fight with agility. Helmets were made of iron or hardened leather, sometimes featuring neck guards or decorative plumes. Even their horses wore padded armor, giving both rider and steed an added layer of protection without sacrificing speed. For several days, the two armies stood facing each other on opposite banks. The horde began to cross the river, the Moscow prince, luring the enemy into a pre-prepared trap, began to withdraw his troops from the river. On August 11, 1378, the Horde forces including 10,000 warriors, led by the commander Begich, crossed the Voza River and engaged the Muscovite army. Initially, Begich had a straightforward strategy. He relied on the sheer power and aggression of his heavy cavalry to break Moscow's defensive lines. With the Horde's numerical superiority, Begich believed his swift and overwhelming assault would cause Moscow's forces to collapse in panic. The battlefield, positioned near the river, seemed to play to the strengths of his cavalry. Begich planned to use their mobility to encircle Moscow's troops or drive them toward the riverbank, leaving them no room to regroup. The strategy focused on a quick, crushing attack to shatter Moscow's formations, exploit weak points, and ultimately annihilate their main forces. However, this plan unraveled due to unforeseen challenges. Moscow's forces, led by Grand Prince Dmitry Donskoy, had meticulously prepared for the confrontation. Dmitry's scouts were instrumental in the lead-up to the battle. Their intelligence-gathering efforts provided vital information, including Begich's intention to use the ford to cross the river. Armed with this knowledge, Dmitry positioned his troops strategically, turning the terrain to his advantage. At the heart of the battlefield, within a dense forest, Moscow's forces had prepared defensive measures. Trenches and ramparts were built, and infantry and crossbowmen were stationed there, ready to repel the Horde's cavalry. On either flank, heavily armed units were placed. One wing was commanded by Daniel Pronsky, 
while the other was under Timofey Velyaminov. Dmitry himself led the Central Regiment, positioned to respond to the main assault. As the Tatar horde began crossing the Voza River, Dmitry Donskoy put his meticulously crafted plan into action. He had prepared his troops not just to hold their ground, but to turn the horde's aggression against them. The first step was an active defense. In the center of the Moscow formation stood archers and crossbowmen who unleashed a relentless barrage of fire upon the advancing horde cavalry. The horde, renowned for their swift and devastating charges, found themselves slowed by the terrain. Dense forests flanked the battlefield, and the riverbanks and marshes further restricted their movements. Their prized cavalry, typically unstoppable on open ground, struggled to maneuver in these conditions. While the horde's frontal assault faltered, Dmitry bided his time. The Moscow troops stood firm, their discipline and positioning holding back the enemy's advance. Then, at the decisive moment, Dmitry led the main regiment in a counterattack. The troops surged forward with precision, striking at the horde with a calculated ferocity that caught them off guard. But Dmitry's strategy did not stop there. Seeing the enemy already disorganized, he signaled his wing regiments to move. These regiments, positioned strategically on either side, launched devastating flank attacks. The horde, accustomed to being the hunters, found themselves surrounded. The center and flanks of their forces were now under attack, splitting their ranks and creating chaos. For the horde, the situation quickly spiraled out of control. The dense forest and marshes, combined with the unrelenting attacks from Moscow's troops, left them unable to regroup. Panic spread like wildfire through their ranks. Soldiers who had once been fierce warriors now fought to escape, abandoning any semblance of order. The river, which had been their crossing point, now became their greatest obstacle. Many tried to retreat, only to be driven into the water. Laden with heavy armor and weapons, they stood little chance. Some drowned in the river's depths, while others were struck down by pursuing Moscow soldiers. To make matters worse, as the fleeing horde forces reached the opposite riverbank, they encountered an unexpected obstacle, the Russian supply train. This wasn't just a convoy carrying provisions, it was part of Dmitry's broader strategy. Positioned on the far side of the river, the train served as both a rearguard and a barrier, ensuring the horde couldn't escape easily. The train's escorts, which included heavily armed infantry, wasted no time. They attacked the disorganized horde soldiers who had managed to cross the river, cutting down anyone who posed a threat. For those still trying to escape through the marshes, the situation was even more dire. Many got stuck in the mud, unable to move, becoming easy targets for Moscow's relentless soldiers. It was a complete rout. Among the dead were Begich, their leader, along with several high-ranking commanders, known as Mirzas, and Temniki, cavalry corps commanders, including Kazibe, Koverga, Karaluk, and Kastrok. The scale of the loss was extraordinary. Typically, horde commanders stayed away from the battlefield, directing their troops from a safe distance. But this time, nearly all of their leadership was wiped out in a single battle, a clear sign of just how devastating their defeat was. As night fell, the darkness brought an end to the pursuit. Moscow's troops regrouped, unable to chase the remaining enemy forces further in the pitch-black conditions. However, Dmitry was not ready to let the survivors escape without consequence. At dawn, he ordered his forces to cross the river and resume the chase. Unfortunately, the remnants of the horde had already retreated too far. Their swift flight made further pursuit impractical. Although the fleeing horde troops evaded capture, they left behind a treasure trove of supplies. Moscow's soldiers found abandoned tents, carts, and provisions filled with goods that the horde had no time to carry. It was a rich reward for their efforts and a clear sign of just how desperate the enemy had been to escape. The Moscow forces also took time to honor their fallen comrades. Burial mounds were erected on the battlefield, marking the site where Moscow's warriors had stood their ground and turned the tide against the Golden Horde. After the battle, Mamai's army was almost completely destroyed and he had to replenish mercenaries for the Battle of Kulikovo in 1380. Moscow's losses were considerably lighter, estimated to be in the hundreds rather than the thousands. The exact number remains unclear. The Battle of Voja is considered one of the first major victories of the Russian principalities against the Golden Horde. Before that, 
the Russian principalities had often suffered defeats or had to accept submission and pay tribute. This was considered an important test, helping Moscow better understand the tactics and weaknesses of the Tatar cavalry and prepare for larger battles. Thanks to that, two years after the Battle of Volzhia, Dmitry Donskoy continued to lead the Russian army to a resounding victory at the Battle of Kulikovo, one of the most famous battles in Russian history. During the time the Mongols and their allies were planning, Dmitry's scouts played a crucial role in the unfolding events. They proved to be highly skilled and effective at gathering intelligence on Mamai's movements and how he was coordinating his forces. They brought back some troubling news. Mamai's army already outnumbered Dmitry's, even before the Lithuanian and Ryazan reinforcements had arrived. Not wanting to waste any time, in June 1380, Dmitry Donskoy immediately called to arms to all of his allies, princes of Beluzero, Jogaila, his rebellious brothers Andrei of Polotsk and Dmitry of Bryansk, Prince Vladimir of Serpukov, and began consolidating his forces at Kolomna. At the same time, the armies of Lithuania, Ryazan and Mamai were marching on Moscow from three sides. Mamai led his own army from the south. The Lithuanian forces approached Moscow from the west, and the Ryazan came from the east. Their plan was to meet together on the south side of the Don River, near a place called Kulikovo, then making the final push towards Moscow. So now, after got the news from Moscow's scouts that Mamai's army encamped south of the Don River, the Grand Prince of Moscow was faced with a critical strategic decision. He had two options. Wait and defend behind the Don River, preparing to face the combined strength of his enemies, or cross the Don and attacking Mamai's forces before reinforcements from Lithuania and Ryazan could arrive. Finally, he chose to fight rather than defend. Late on the night of September 7th, under a thick morning fog, the Russian army crossed the Don River. By the early hours of the next day, as the fog began to lift, the troops started to form their battle lines. Dmitry Donskoy's army was strategically arranged into three lines, each serving a crucial purpose. Imagine standing alongside his forces. At the front, scouts acted as the eyes of the army, tasked with spotting the Mongol approach and engaging in minor skirmishes to slow them down. Behind them was the main infantry regiment, equipped with a Tsilitsi, short spears ideal for throwing, and sturdy shields made from wood and metal. Their armor included the Bazuband for arm protection and greaves for the shins, preparing them for Mongol assaults. At the center stood Dmitri's elite guard, a mix of heavy cavalry and infantry. These heavily armored cavalrymen wore chainmail and wielded sabers and maces, ideal for close combat. Dmitri also deployed smaller flanking detachments to prevent Mongol. Surprises. A secret weapon lay hidden in an oak grove. An elite cavalry unit led by Prince Vladimir of Serpukov. This unit was poised to launch a surprise attack when the Mongols became overextended, turning the tide of battle in Dmitri's favor. Right behind the front lines was the core of Dmitri Donskoy's army his personal guard, which included both infantry and heavy cavalry. Before Mongol rule, horses were a luxury in Russia. However, the Mongols' battlefield dominance led Russians to realize they needed their own cavalry. By the 13th to 15th centuries, professional cavalry units emerged from the elite warrior class. These soldiers, drawn from wealthy noble families, were equipped with the necessary horses and gear, marking a significant evolution in Russian military tactics and preparing them for the challenges of Mongol warfare. That morning, the Mongol army was still fatigued from their long march and not particularly skilled in scouting. It quickly became evident to them that the Russians were preparing for battle. Under Mamai's command, they moved to confront the enemy. The Mongol force far outnumbered the combined armies of the Russian princes, comprising a regular army, unlike the Russians, who still operated at a guard level. Mamai organized his troops into three lines. The first line consisted of light Mongol Tatar cavalry, agile and quick, intended for harassment and skirmishes. The second line delivered the heavy firepower, featuring cavalry and Genoese infantry armed with crossbows. The third line was a mix of Mongol cavalry and infantry, with auxiliary regiments positioned to guard the flanks. Mamai observed from a hilltop, strategically placed for command and protection. His warriors were battle-ready from a young age, mastering archery, horse riding, and various weapons, with speed being their hallmark. They used composite bows, allowing them to shoot accurately while galloping, 
with each archer carrying multiple bows and arrows tailored for different situations. The Mongols' remarkable agility and tactical organization made them a formidable force on the battlefield. Dmitri's army was estimated to be around 30,000 men, but the Mongol force was much larger, likely numbering between 40,000 to 50,000 warriors. That's a big difference, and it gave the Mongols a clear advantage in terms of sheer numbers. The battle kicked off when Mamai's advanced troops charged straight into the first line of Russian sentries, with support from crossbow fire coming from the Genoese mercenaries behind them. It was quick, fierce, and brutal. The Mongols had the numbers though, and eventually, Dmitri's first line had to fall back. But they did so slowly and in good order, retreating to regroup with the advance regiment stationed right behind them. Seeing this unfold, Mamai sent his second wave forward, which included the Genoese heavy infantry in the center. That's when the real brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat began. Thousands of soldiers were clashing, swinging all kinds of weapons, trying desperately to avoid getting hit from every direction. It was chaos. As the fight raged on, the Russian left flank, which was weaker, started to bend and give way little by little. Mamai noticed this right away and seized the moment, ordering his Mongol light cavalry to charge and hit the eastern side of the Russian line. In response, the Russian commander on the left flank pushed forward a bit, trying to threaten the Mongol cavalry without fully committing, knowing that if he stretched too far, the whole left side could expose too much. But despite the Russians' best efforts, the pressure from both the Mongol infantry and that cavalry charge was just too much. The second Russian line couldn't hold on and had to retreat, this time merging with the main regiment where Dmitri himself was holding position. At this point, Mamai probably thought this was the moment the battle would be decided. Spotting Dmitri's personal banner on the field, Mamai sent in his heavy cavalry, aiming straight for Dmitri's position. His plan was clear, take out the leader, and the battle would be over. What followed was an enormous, brutal brawl, with both sides fully locked in ferocious medieval combat, each trying to get the upper hand. It was a life or death struggle across the battlefield. The battle was so fierce that it transformed the ground into a bloody swamp, with countless men from both sides falling in the chaos. Even amidst the turmoil, the Mongol commander kept a strong reserve force ready for this crucial moment. Believing the entire Russian line was engaged, he ordered his last reserve to charge the exposed left flank of the Russians. The Mongol cavalry thundered across the battlefield, crashing into the vulnerable side of Dmitri's army. At this point, his troops were already weary, and this brutal flanking attack pushed them to their breaking point. Just when it looked like the battle was about to turn into a Mongol triumph, a cavalry trumpet sounded from the eastern edge of the field. Out of the woods came the ambush regiment led by Prince Vladimir, charging in at the perfect moment. Their timing was impeccable, catching the Mongols completely by surprise. The fresh, elite cavalrymen slammed into the unprotected flanks of the Mongol forces, igniting panic among their ranks. The Russians, filled with newfound courage, pursued the retreating horde for nearly 50 kilometers, while Mamai barely escaped with his life. Casualties were heavy on both sides, though exact numbers remain a mystery. Dmitri's army likely lost about a third of their strength, while the Mongol forces faced a devastating defeat. But even as Dmitri celebrated this hard-won victory, trouble loomed on the horizon. Another formidable Mongol warlord was already preparing to strike. After hearing about Mamai's defeat, Prince Jogaila returned to Lithuania, while the Ryazan people aggressively attacked the retreating detachments, plundering them and taking prisoners. Prince Dmitri of Moscow prepared for a counterattack, but a significant shift occurred when Prince Oleg of Ryazan fled, causing the Ryazan boyars to welcome Moscow's governors. Upon his return, Oleg had to recognize Dmitri's authority, referring to him as his older brother and signing a peace treaty. Meanwhile, Muhammad Bolak, Mamai's puppet Khan, was killed in battle. Mamai fled to the Genoese stronghold of Kaffa in Crimea, hoping to regroup. However, his support dwindled without a legitimate Khan leading many of his nobles to defect to his rival, Toktamish. Eventually, Mamai was killed in Kaffa, marking the collapse of his horde. Toktamish emerged as the dominant power, ending the 20-year split within the Golden Horde. Now, let's talk about Prince Dmitri, who became known as Donskoy, of the Don, after the battle. Did not manage to become fully independent from the Golden Horde. However, 
the victory at Kulikovo marked the beginning of the decline of Mongol power. In the century that followed, Moscow's influence grew, consolidating control over other Russian principalities. This gradual shift culminated in 1480, when Russia finally broke free from the Golden Horde after defeating them at the Great Stand on the Ugra River. Dmitry Donskoy's victory at Kulikovo in 1380 marked a pivotal moment for Moscow, elevating its status as the leading principality of Rus. This triumph bolstered unity among fragmented principalities and established Moscow as the defender of orthodoxy and resistance against Mongol rule. However, the struggle was far from over. In 1382, Khan Tokhtamish retaliated by sacking Moscow, reasserting the Golden Horde's dominance. Despite this devastating setback, Moscow rebuilt its defenses, consolidated power, and remained resolute in its quest for independence. Over the following decades, Moscow's influence steadily grew, setting the stage for future victories. A significant turning point came under Ivan III from 1462 to 1505, also known as Ivan the Great. He expanded Moscow's territory by annexing Novgorod in 1478 and Tver in 1485. Ivan centralized governance, diminished the power of regional princes, and enhanced military strength, positioning Moscow as a formidable power. The final break from Mongol rule occurred in 1480 at the Great Stand on the Ugra River. Ivan III faced Akhmat Khan of the Golden Horde in a tense standoff that ended without bloodshed as the Horde retreated. This event marked the end of the Mongol yoke and the rise of a unified sovereign Rus. We get the detail of Ugra River battle in the comment. If you're interested in, feel free to check it out. And don't forget to subscribe to not miss the new videos.